Hello and welcome to the Geometer's Compass. I'm Jeff speaking from Dublin in Ireland and this is Scott Onstott in Victoria, Canada. And so we're just finding our way with creating a podcast for the, the, the first time and we're really enjoying it because the truth is Scott and I have a shared passion for over two decades personally and together as friends for over a decade for sacred geometry in all its forms and mysterious glory. And so the purpose of this podcast is essentially to capture some of the things that float our boat, essentially. Is, is that a fair point, Scott? Yeah, and we just want to kind of keep it free flowing so that we don't, we're not reading a script and we're just uh, having a conversation. So we hope you appreciate listening to our conversations. And so one of the things we, we were thinking about uh, triggering off each each podcast with is kind of like a spark or an idea, you know, just to get it to open the doors into what we hope is an interesting conversation for you, dear listener. So what we're going to do is today we were actually reflecting upon this idea that we often say in our workshops and, and, and in our books that sacred geometry has this incredible capacity to transform your state of consciousness. I would even go as far to say it's it, sacred geometry holds the power to expand your state of consciousness and also heighten your state of consciousness. And so, but you know, to actually make that real, we wanted to sort of ask ourselves today, well, what do we mean by that? Like, what do we mean by, what are you talking about when you say sacred geometry has the power to change your state of consciousness, you know? And um, this is something that I've experienced personally over many, many years of doing my own personal work with sacred geometry, drawing the geometry, creating sand mandalas and having very, very deep, rich meditative experiences, courtesy of sacred geometry. And um, I know, Scott, you've also experienced the same at the work you've done, you know, but let's use this podcast to really explore this question. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I like the spirit of what you're saying about how it expands consciousness or, or I don't know, deepens or, or something like that. But I, I take issue in a way because I wrote this book about philosophy and, and if we want to be more exact with that, now there he printed it out. Um, he's really old school. He prints it out, <laughs> and he, the, the manuscript before it was made into a book. And, uh, and I, thank you so much for editing that, by the way, Jeff. Um, you bet. I, I, your Pleasure. feedback was invaluable as we went through it. You're kind of like, on page 57 now, you said this. And I was like, wow, you're really taking it seriously. I appreciate that. Hey, I loved, I loved every bit of it. It's a, it's a joy to join you on that, like, that seminal journey of like, really going through the first draft. It's an epic read, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, I was, I was saying that um, I was trying, I had a section in the book called Misnomers of Consciousness. Mm. And in the, I think it's in that section where I discuss, like, in, in kind of, it's common in self-help areas and books to, to say, you know, um, working on your consciousness or expanding your consciousness. This is very common parlance generally. Um, but um, if you think about, like, last podcast we did we talked about the absolute and the relative mm -hmm. and how the absolute is um, unbounded infinite it has no limitations or qualities mm -hmm. um, and or gradations or levels and so you that's consciousness or awareness and, and mm -hmm. so to say that you're expanding something that has no limitations it has no boundaries or qualities it doesn't make sense you see mm -hmm. that that now now we're suddenly putting a, a whole scale on the on the infinite and, and mm. it just falls flat in my opinion if if you're if you're trying if you're trying to if you're starting to think and wrestle with these philosophical issues it, it becomes clear that um we need different words to describe mm. this phenomenon that you're expressing um mm. But I think we need to kind of maybe we can have a conversation about what what should we call it, you know? Mm. And what's I love what you're there. saying. Yeah, I love what you're saying, and it actually it really makes sense to me. You know, after reading your book, I do understand the sort of this foundational principle of the absolute, as you refer to it. You know, and so how can something that's unbounded 
and has no uh, qualities of manifested reality e expand. It's already, it's infinite. It's already, or, or, it's already there. Yeah. So what, what like, I think it's, it's the relative side of the street that is expanding. Mm -hmm, you know, mm -hmm, it's it's yes, actually your yeah. mind. What I call your mind is, yeah. is, is the relative finite, limited experience awareness has of you as an individual. Mm -hmm. Like, let me give you an example, you know, like just on a very basic level, you know, like say, you know, I'm a creature of habit and I get kind of like wrapped up in the grind of my daily patterns, you know, and a lot of them are quite mundane, you know, like go to the grocery store, you know, do a school run um, come home and do a little bit of work, send some emails, you know, and uh, it's a pretty mundane state of consciousness, to be honest, you know, and I long for more. I long for um, qualities of experience that are beyond that realm actually i just for some i think all of us do have a desire to transcend that kind of everyday mundane realm so i think you're right i think we need to just clarify what we mean when we say it expands your consciousness so you know if i if i go from from that sort of mundane state of consciousness let's say i do something very simple like go for a walk and it's a beautiful evening and and I see a gorgeous full moon rise or something. And then I feel touched by that. And then I can kind of experience because of the sacred geometry I carry around with me. I can experience the relationship of our satellite, the moon with the planet Earth, just in a, in a fun, loving kind of like it's just a nice quality thought to run through your 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 thinking apparatus. You know, I feel different. I feel different when I do that than when I'm. Uh, like sending an email, uh, you know, like a pretty boring work email, for example, you know, and so I'm, I, so, I mean, it's a, it's a little bit of a lofty claim to say that's expanding consciousness. No, but, but, but there is a maybe, kind of expansiveness to that good feeling, isn't there? Mm, yeah, you know, yeah. You're, you're, and I think what you're doing is it's kind of like layers of the onion and, and you're, you're mm. starting to experience we could call them higher levels of the onion, mm -hmm. um, uh, like, and and you're and when you're doing that, it it has this expansive quality to it, because mm -hmm. now you're on a larger shell around the core, you know, and so you you've reached a different level of of mentation, because now you're you're experiencing, let's say, the collective human soul. You you go into a dreamlike state maybe, and now you have access to all the archetypes that are common to all of humanity. Uh, mm. And you start to pull in those into your, and, the, and you pull those down into your individual notions. And mm -hmm. so that, that's one way we, we, we expand our consciousness is through dreaming. You know, we, we go there every night, we tend to go there every night and we not, might not always remember it, but we can even pull that in, in the waking state, especially if you, if you ever have tried to write fiction or just mm -hmm. like to daydream or imagine or visualize these things our natural levels that we go to and their levels in mind, technically they're not bigger consciousness, but it feels that way maybe. But I, I think what's really happening there is that you, your awareness is moving into larger vistas, larger areas of mind. Yeah. And maybe, maybe rather than the, the sort of the, the grand claim, which I do know sweeps of sort of, popular psychology and and by the way i'm a huge fan of popular psychology there's a huge amount of good in it as well there's probably a huge amount of dross too if we're honest you know and so to sort of say transform your consciousness you know in seven days five easy steps you know it, it's it's not really our vibe is it we're not really talking about that maybe maybe what we're talking about more is that we it, it invites you to a, a change in your state maybe maybe that's more yeah. what it's about you you step into a new consciousness state. It's like turning a dial on a, like turning the channel on a dial, click. And but in a way, it, it can even be like in the deepest kind of expansive feelings that we have, like in our workshops, when we do head cleaner or when mm. we go really deep into geometry and use it as a vehicle to, to take you deeper or higher. Mm -hmm. um, I think that it's more than just a, a state of consciousness. We're not, we're not just accessing an altered state, but we're, <clears throat> we're actually interfacing with the universal intelligible mind, which is the, the mind that where geometry exists in my philosophy, you know, 
Okay. Okay. I love. I love this. So we're interacting with the universal intelligible mind. Okay. Let's let's yeah. just hold on to that thought there because I just want to finish this idea of like changing our state, right? Which is something I think we all desire. I am um, strangely. I went mountain biking by the way today for the first time in my life. I think the last time I went mountain biking was thirty years ago. Okay. <laughs> okay. And I had so much fun changing between these states where I was like, I was worried I might fall off, you know, and then all of a sudden I just surrendered a little bit and then I could kind of flow and I could kind of get into this flow state and it felt really, really nice. And then all of a sudden, if I thought I was getting really good, then I might nearly like take a reckless turn and I would nearly fall off, you know, and I was enjoying kind of exploring the, the journey between these two states. OK, point I'm trying to make is there's many, many things can change your state, right? Yeah. Yoga can change your state. Meditation can change it. Good art, good music, going to a concert, you know. I think everybody longs, we all have a way to change our state. I think it's just a fundamental human Every need, day right? we're doing that many times a day. You know, when you, when you yeah. go to lunch, you're in a different frame of mind than you are yeah. when you're at your desk working, you know? Exactly. Now, but, but here's the thing that we're, I, we're, I think we're trying to make, and we do feel strongly about this, Scott, that sacred geometry is more than that. It, it offers more than sort of a flow state peak experience for mountain biking, not knocking that at all. I would, I can't wait to do it again. It's amazing. Yeah. But, but, but geometry has a certain potency in my opinion, and it, it gets close to what you're talking about when you say you're interacting with the intelligible mind of the universe. Is that what you said? Yeah. The universal mind, you know? Yeah. So, so it's, so, it's a qualitatively different thing than just changing your state from waking to dreaming to deep sleep or as you said um mountain biking flow, or flow state mountain flow biking state, or whatever or right brain cognition or left brain cognition i mean these mm -hmm. things are all lovely and all important um ways of uh focusing the mind and and i have a term for that i think it's a modes of modes of mind is in my book mm -hmm. i talk about that but um that that's not what geometry is doing i mean it may mm -hmm. do that if you if you if you go outside and you draw in the sun and then you go and come inside and you decorate it, you know, at your mm. desk there, you can have those minor kind of state changes. That's fine. But that's not the point. It, what we're, what we're saying mm. is that geometry is a qualitatively different thing. Mm -hmm. Isn't that right? Yeah. And so, so here's, here's where I think it gets, this conversation gets juicy, right? So you speak about we're actually interacting with the intelligible mind of the creative principle. I sometimes call it, or I use, I think you call it the creative minded cosmos or whatever, but it's, it's like, it's kind of this foundational layer. Okay. That brings the manifested realm into existence. So I almost look at it like in using your model, you speak about the absolute, which is kind of like, you know, the primordial, um, uh, void, you know, the emptiness out of which all form arises or whatever, right? Yeah, and, and it's also the consciousness that you're, you know, yeah, experiencing right source of moment. all being. And it's yeah. immediate and, and part of every moment as well. It's not this abstraction. Yeah. You know? Now, let's say a daisy decides it wants to come into manifestation, right? And it says, hey, yeah, I really fancy reaching towards the sun, okay? And so the daisy has to be seeded somewhere in the right soil at the right part of the planet, and eventually it'll start breaking the soil and reach towards the sun. Now, what the daisy harnesses to bring itself into form is sacred geometric principles, right? What the, the, what the human being um, harnesses to come into manifestation are sacred geometric principles. You know, what the planets of the solar system harness to bring themselves into manifestation from the emptiness or the void or whatever it is, um, is sacred geometric principles. Yes. So, so I, even the atoms, even atoms themselves are little sacred geometries. Their electron orbitals are these pure geometries of probability distribution. And they're like mm. little, little jewels, you know, of math, mm. uh, even mm. on the smallest scale. Um, the universe is made of this math, this geometry. Yeah. You know? And yeah. all throughout from the smallest. Um, remember, the big stuff is made of the little stuff. So, yeah. so it's all a kind of expression of geometry. And, and so that, that gets deeper into like the whole universe is made of, of is literally written in this language. Yeah. The whole universe is written in this language. Okay. 
Okay, so let's just keep thickening the plot here a little bit. Okay, so these are kind of cool ideas, right? And and I love ideas. Like I love goofing around. Like, wow, that's cool. Are you sure? Like atoms are made with these principles? Why our DNA really? Our bodies, the solar system, the whole galaxy is made with these principles. That's super cool, you know. But that's a kind of a part of my mind that's kind of a, like enjoys goofing around with cool ideas, right? Um, and sacred geometry gives you that in abundance. Oh my God, it's never ending. You could spend 10,000 lifetimes just exploring the manifestation of sacred geometry in reality. And but I, I personally- But all of that is, is somehow limited, I think is where you're going, right? Well, yeah, yeah. I, well, I, it's not, it's like, well, here's what I'm trying to say is that it's a big part of it. You know, it, maybe it's half of it, you know, but but then what? What's, this is what I think is super cool about geometry in particular is that you seem to get to a point with it. Let me just go with this, actually. This is, I'm going to share a little bit about how it happens for me, right? I tend to start my journey with a geometric meditation, exploring these principles, these ideas of form, okay? So I go, oh, the golden ratio forms DNA, the golden ratio forms um, the, the arms of the galaxy. All of these things are kind of like key principles of existence, you know? And then what I do is... I get to a point where I kind of exhaust those um, channels of thinking where I, I I just my thinking mind can no longer bear. It's almost like it becomes burdensome or something. And you get to a point where no matter how far down the rabbit hole of trying to work it all out, you go, you finally get to a point where you're like, you know, what? I give up. I actually surrender, you know, and somehow in this point, this magic point where I stop trying to work out why is 18 pointed petals, mandalas, similar to the glyph of the, um, you know, the resonance of the, the cymatics of the Schumann resonance or something. Mm -hmm. This is all kind of my thinking mind, you know, and I just actually shut the, excuse my French up and just surrender to that. Something truly radical happens, you know, where I end up like just arriving in a completely different feeling experience of sacred geometry. Does that make sense? Oh, yeah. And I, I feel that too. You know, it's kind of like in that case, <clears throat> your consciousness as the absolute is feeling the limitation of your individual mind. And it's mm. feeling that, that that's interesting somewhat, but ultimately it's a kind of, bounded container that is limited and kind of boring ultimately. Mm. And so awareness has the absolute right to transcend that mind. And you, you pass that boundary and you go into this deeper realm of existence. And usually you might do that. How would you, how would you characterize that Jeff? And I, I know you had a recent experience with the rainbow situation. Yeah. So for me, I kind of begin to get to a place with it where when I'm thinking about geometry, for example, I'm thinking about it, I'm working through the ideas, you know, I'm, I'm spinning all of these forms in my, in my mind, you know, I'm thinking about DNA, I'm thinking about the arms of the galaxy. But when I break through to this kind of like surrender point, I'd call it, um, I actually cease all thinking. It's like that part of my mind just like it dissolves, like I sometimes think it's like if you were to get like a really, really hot pan, OK, and put it on, put it on a, a really, really searing hot cooker. OK, you put a pan on it and just get one drop of water. OK, and then you throw just one drop of water on the hottest pan you can imagine. It to jumps around, dip. doesn't it? It moves around. No, like no, no. This no, this pan is so hot, Scott. This okay. is the hottest pan that's ever existed in the universe. OK, it's like when the drop hits it. It just, it instantly vaporizes. vaporizes. Like it goes, and it's kind of like, that's what happens. My thinking mind, it vaporizes. It goes like yeah. this, this is the sound it makes, you know? And I, I can't really grasp language. Words are no longer any help. Yeah. Um, yeah. Because the, I'm not, you've, I'm not, you've gone past the mind. So the mind can't come back in a mundane way and explain it all to you as a mind would want to. Because it's yeah. no longer even present, you know. Yeah. 
And, and that's yeah, the beauty I'm, of it, right? And I know you've had a lot of experiences transcending the mind in your life, you know. Mm. And um, I know holotropic breathwork is one way that you huge, can interrupt huge. the filtering process of the brain in a way and, and kind of escape the bounds of your mind and, and mm. actually have phenomenal experiences that transcend mm. the mind. Isn't that right? That's, you're absolutely right. And the experiences I've had in holotropic breathwork are totally lined up with this. And they're they're a huge kind of like contributor to to my personal experiences of beyond the mind, you know, yeah. and and it's not like, you know, it's not I, I certainly haven't. It, it's you know, it's not life changing or radically um, enlightenment or it's not anything like that it's actually a beautifully simple place to arrive at and you feel this kind of complete contentment wash over you where the sort of the hungry ghosting of trying to work out all the ideas right they sort of seem funny in a way or you can see them as these little like like ephemeral bubbles in a much bigger cosmic dance and they just don't seem that important anymore, you know, yeah. and that's not dismissing the coolness of DNA being formed by by the golden ratio. It, you know, it, you but you sort of go. Oh, you, you, you don't yeah. you don't need to work it out or something. You don't I think you it's know, similar it's just... to a lot of near death experiences in the sense that mm. like I speculate that when we die, we might feel something like that. Like, you know what? All those problems I had in this life were or what they were, but it doesn't bother me. Yeah, Everything yeah, yeah, is yeah. So complete and so beautiful. Um, yeah, that I'm completely happy. Um, in you know, in f- full. And I mm-hmm. think I think we we get glimpses of, of that by studying geometry. And you have mm. to kind of use your left brain and use that be in the mind area for a time, until you kind of That's come the to thing. the end of it. You know, until you until your consciousness kind of realizes, okay, I get this. And now this is boring. And I, I'm, I'm going to lose the bounds of this kind of bound, this limitation. And, yeah. and it's quite relieving, isn't it? To, uh, yeah, ah, just to relax into universal mind. And it also has a feeling of, rem- of remembrance, like, oh yeah. Oh yeah. I yeah. remember this. Even though yeah, yeah. your mind doesn't remember it, doesn't know what you're talking about. Yeah. And yeah. it is like this sense of a homecoming or arriving, you know, arriving back at this sense of like satisfied completeness or something, you know. Mm-hmm. But hang on, there's two things I want to jump in here and say, first of all, right, is I think the key point we're getting at here and trying to make is that sacred geometry brings both of these forces to bear in con in in sorry our individual awareness i suppose because consciousness gets confusing let's say our individual awareness sacred geometry invites you to spin your thinking mind really full on it amplifies it in a way you know and it also then opens the doorway through to something bigger than that you know yeah. and and i wouldn't like to give the impression that well, it's all about getting into the big mind experience or it's all about, uh, you know, getting beyond the mind because you could just have supreme experiences of the most high grade ideas that exist in the universe. Just thinking about these beautiful forms. Yeah, that, that's to be enjoyed in a as rose. well. Exactly. Yeah. That, that the, that's not just about transcendence, which is part yeah. of it, but it's also about imminence, about being in the body, in the world, grounded. Yeah. In the yeah. in in the thought forms, um, because that's part of it, isn't it? That's part of the whole drama that we're enmeshed in, and we yeah. should honor that because it's very complicated. And presumably, there's some reason that we're that infinite infinity is playing around with the finite. Yeah, yeah. And then the more I kind of like grow into this way of thinking and being, the more I kind of feel that when we are blessed with these little breakthrough moments, you know, where we arrive at a connection to something way bigger than the little me, at least, and we feel this sort of awesome sense of, um, it's, it, it's, to me, it's kind of like a spiritual connection, actually, just being totally truthful. Um, uh, it's a spiritual connection to something f- unbelievably bigger than anything I could imagine 
myself to be, you know, and there's a sort of comfort that comes with that. There's a there's a comforting feeling. But here's here's the here's the key, I think, for me, at least that that's great. Right. And let's say you go off to a lovely retreat up in the hill somewhere and you have these beautiful experiences. Well, well done you, you know, but where it really actually begins to bear fruit is that when you bring that back into the mundane realm and you bring that back to when the next time you're on the motorway and that guy pulls out or that lady pulls out in front of you. And before where that would just set you off for the rest of the afternoon, you know, if you can bring even just a droplet of, of that energy from the being realm or whatever, and you can bring that in onto the motorway where that person cuts you off and you can just sort of almost frame that in just another cosmic expression of a form both on the motorway and your reaction in consciousness, then you're freed, actually. Then you're freed. And, and then you, the way you be with others in the mundane realm changes. It changes everything in a way. You know, you're kind of... You know, it's, like, it's like playing a video game, like a first-person shooter, right? Mm-hmm. When, when you take the perspective of that avatar that you're playing as, that character that in the role-playing game, um, mm. you're enmeshed in every little drama and every little slight and insult and and um, every achievement that you have and every skill tree that you you know, you know add to your your in every item that you add to your inventory you're very much into that mm. but the metaphor is is you are not the avatar you're actually that you're the player sitting back playing the avatar remember yeah and yeah, so yeah. when you can remember oh wait I'm playing a game um, then when, when these bad things happen to your character um, or good things, you, you can take it as, a, as what it is, a game. It is like a, there's a degree of separation or something. Yeah, it's it, like you, you see it from a higher level and you're like, mm-hmm. oh, yeah, that person cut me off on the motorway. And that's the, the script their character is playing. Um, yeah. But, um, and, and it's even more expansive than people sitting on sofas in different rooms playing a game because ultimately there's only one consciousness playing all games yes yeah know? yeah and, and so yeah. Uh, and so when when you can get a glimpse of that and then you you kind of remember oh yeah yeah it's meant to be fun why am it's i not having to be fun? fun and i love yeah. what you're saying it's like um the my teacher, Stanislav Graf, you know, who I have a huge amount of respect for, he's actually written a book called The Cosmic Game, you know, and um, I think he, I think the term is like Leela, is like there's, there's, there's this, uh, maybe it's a Sanskrit term, I'm not sure, but it's, it's the idea is that the sort of, the whole dance of reality is just a game, you know, and it's a privilege to be given the opportunity to play it, you know, but if you get so attached to thinking that like it all begins and ends with the little me then it's a it's a very um burdensome way of going through the game you know where if you can unhook yourself from from those attachments to the little me and realize whoa we're all just tapped into this much much bigger tapestry you know and i don't really have to worry too much about being in charge of everything or whatever you can surrender a bit more into something much bigger it really changes you a lot. And I think really this is looping us back to the start of this podcast. This is when we say sacred geometry changes your state of consciousness. Um, It's maybe the language now should be like, it changes your state of mind or it changes your state of being or, you know, I don't, you know, so I think we're getting closer to it. Philosophically, I'm most comfortable with like changes your state of mind because if you're, if you're being, you know, being is being, you're not, you can't change that. You, you yeah. can't change the infinite. You, if you add three to the infinite, it's still the infinite, you know? Yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. I know what so you it's, mean. It's, it's, it's unimportant that you, that you're expanding the infinite because it's already yeah. there, you know, but, how about but in our then? language, how else can we say it? You know, like um, we, we are, we are deepening our appreciation. Well, Changes something. your state of mind is okay. Let's go with that. I'll yeah. I'll I'll give you that. I like that. But and then maybe like connects you to being something like that. Well, yeah. Again, no? that's sort of a performative contradiction. But that, I I can go with it. <laughs> and you know what? We we can no, all no no no. Tell me tell me because I like that. It's kind of like um. What I'm trying to say is like 
when you finally escape the kind of the, the sort of the spinning wheels of thought and you finally get a glimpse of connection to something, yeah. there's a sense of just being with that, just being with something bigger. It's like you, you drop into feeling you're tapped into it, you know, and this is so cool that, and in that moment, and it usually only lasts for me like a nanosecond. It's like, you know, you just, you pierce through the veil for a nanosecond. And in that nanosecond, you're, you're being, you know, you're just truly being, you know, yeah. or you're connected to being maybe. No. I like it. Um, and there's no way. But to I can see it, but I like it, Jeff, but there's don't no hold way, back now, Scott. Don't there's be no shy. way to really express it clearly with mind because what we're saying is we're going beyond that mm. so we're going to just expand our consciousness and we're going to be fine with that because it's just yeah. Good as anything. <laughs> yeah 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 totally and um i i'm a huge fan of eckhart tolle as well you know what i mean and um I, I really, I think he's very funny as well, you know, and uh, one of one of his kind of like uh, CDs or whatever I was listening to, he, he kind of was joking around about, you know, the journey towards enlightenment or whatever, you know, when you go on these spiritual courses, which I do all the time, by the way, you know, and um, he was he was making the point that when you connect with being right, the last thing you need is time. Right. Because it's actually time that keeps you from entering the ever present moment or whatever. Right. And so it's just it's the little you, the kind of ego me, if you like, that goes, oh, I need more time. If I just had more time, I'd get there, you know, and there's this irony at play. And he kind of he makes this joke about, you know, well, there's seven steps. And it's going to take you seven years, you know, and then the, the ego mind goes, oh, great. This is fabulous. OK, there's seven steps. All right. It's going to take me seven years and yeah. then I'm going to get there, you know, and and but and I really want to make this point about sacred geometry. There's nowhere to go. There's nothing to work out. You don't have to be this kind of world class geometer or this kind of esoteric San Mandala artist that, you know, we can break through to being in a heartbeat, like in a nanosecond. Now, yeah. boom. It's not like you have you to are. take all of our courses and then when you do, you'll be enlightened. <laughs> And you're just no. two courses away from it right now. <laughs> Quite the opposite. No. Quite, you know, it's like our courses are going to get you stuck in the thinking mind, you know, which could be fun. Please come join our courses, you know. But um, head cleaner might help you get there a little bit more. You know, head cleaner might get you to, to experience a well, bit I of being, all, I hope. I think you they're know? all important. I think in order to, to really appreciate the view from the top of the mountain, you have to walk up there. And there are many paths up the mountain, but you've got to get, you've got to do the work and get yourself up there. And then only then do you see where you are in, in the context of the planet or, or the universe or, and you get that aha moment, right? So there's, yeah. the, there's like, but it's all part of it. You, you, you have to, you have to do that too. You know, you, you can't bet. neglect those duties of, you know, working on, on the little me and, and creating these neural pathways and so on. It's all part of the beauty of 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 the the journey i think yeah to, and i there's a term I, I like and i think it's it's kind of um speaking to what you're saying about um it's like being and becoming being and becoming it's like this dance between stan Groff goes on about like you know um having these big state experiences you can you can you can change your state so that your consciousness can become commensurate with all that is and everything that's possible in the cosmic dance you are capable of experiencing you know um our our consciousness are like fields of consciousness you know and um and that's amazing that's kind of these breakthrough to these big being experiences you know and then ken wilbur then comes in and he says well that's all great but unless we do the hard grind unless every day of the kind interior of... and the exterior of the individual <laughs> and the collective but i Only i love that, i love you know. ken i love ken wilbur i have to say i really rate oh, his uh, his yeah. model too he's he's um he, you know, he, he's like about tilling the soil, you know, and he says, you know, you can have those being experiences, but unless you till the soil and you get some kind of daily practice going and we do, and, and this is this kind of becoming then, you know, it's kind of, I think in, in one of his, his, his riffs on spiral dynamics, he says, it takes about two years if you're like really on it and you're really investing in developing a daily practice well and he makes a distinction of of states which is groff 
in yeah. stages, which is like yeah, uh, states and stages. You know, J- uh, Gebser and and others who talk about spiral dynamics uh, and will yeah. and you know like there's there's kind of like these these brief e- ephemeral uh, stages that you can in, you know experience our states yeah st- states I mean. And then, yeah. then the stages are more like durable and, and that's really harder to move the needle on that one. And, and they yeah. actually represent like years of your life, you know, suddenly crystallize in a new way of thinking. A whole yeah. new phenomenological world exists that you can mm. walk into and start to see everything differently. And that's like, what I'm trying to do with my book is kind of invite you into a new worldview, a whole new yeah. stage you know, but you, you're not going to even want to read the book if you're at an earlier stage, you know, and, and, and people that are really into relativism just hate the idea that there might be stages to cognitive mm. development. But mm-hmm. I mean, it's, it's true. Look at human development. We sure have come a long way from being an infant, you know, mm-hmm. and why would we think that all of that growth would be arrested at age 18 or something, yeah. you know, it goes on throughout your life and the characters that you go, the the kind of characteristics of these stages are quite different from one another. Just introspect Mm -hmm. on your own past in the way, in the old ways that you used to look at things when you were a teenager or when you were in your twenties or, or just, I don't know where you are in your life journey now, if you're a listener, but I think anyone who's listening to this will be able to introspect on past ways that they used to, you know, think of the world and, and compare that with where you are now. And imagine that there, that there might be some future ways that you might um, think of things that you're not even acquainted with yet. Um, mm-hmm. Like learning is kind of learning what you didn't even know you didn't know, mm-hmm. you know? And, and so how would you know what it's about until you do the work, you know? You bet. Yeah. Yeah. I love that, Scott. I was just kind of, I was just joking around there in my head. I was thinking if we were to get all of the works of Stanislav Grof, on the stages stuff and all of the, the the stuff from Ken Wilbur on the on the state stuff, you know. Sorry, other way around. Stanislav I know, I, I Graf mix up brings too, the like, state stuff. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Stanislav Graf, throw all of his works right into a big glass, right? Yeah. And then get Ken Wilbur, all his work on stages. Throw that into a big glass. Yeah. And we're going to make a new cocktail. This could be like some new groovy <laughs> cocktail yeah. in a fancy bar in New York. And, what, and, and that could and, we could we could call it the, the sacred geo. Would be the name of that cocktail yeah, because it, sacred well, geometry brings it both these things. Is really the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but um, I think it's probably a nice place to end for today, Scott. I don't know how long have we been going. I mean, we're trying to keep these to half an hour, aren't we? Yeah, I think I'm, we're, we're probably a little past that, maybe. But uh, I don't know. It's a good point. Cool. To start. Yeah. Cool. But that was fun. I hope I was certainly fun for me. I hope you enjoyed it, Scott, and That's and I, I hope our listeners are are enjoying it too. You know, it's um. It's certainly, I've listened to many, many podcasts like everybody on planet Earth, you know, but it feels a little bit different when you're actually putting something out there and um, and, and such a joy to actually just being so, so, um, uh, it's so enjoyable to put your passion out into the world, isn't it? And also, even if if no one listens, I'm really of happy, I'm happy to be able to have these conversations <laughs> with you, Jeff. And me, it's me too. a good way for us to do it, you know. Yeah, and, yeah, well, yeah. We'll just imagine that, that that there's at least one person who's listening out there. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Right. All right. Thank you, dear listener, you know, wherever you are, yeah. you know, our one person on planet Earth, you know, um, you're special to us. That's for sure. Yeah.